Yeah, well, I, I think that the Jordan River is just such a beautiful spot. When I moved to Victoria about a year and a half ago, it was one of the places that I kept hearing about as like, you have to go here. So of course, of course I went and I saw just how great it is. And as soon as I started to learn about how the three different industries have changed it uh, over the years, I just got really interested to see how that happened and what the effects are and what's being done to reverse those, uh, those decades of um, industrial work. When I first started working on uh, looking at the river and, and thinking about, to think about ways to restore it, a lot of people said, you know, you're wasting your time. It's, it's been a dead river for many years and, and that's, that's how uh, it will always, always be. And I started to realize that it, wa it wasn't dead, it was, it was just sick and it has a lot of things constraining it. And um, I think it's just really important for me to take care uh, and to do what I can to help improve the state of this, this sick ecosystem. So there was a mine that contaminated the river and really wiped out the fish populations. Um, and then BC Hydro also has a dam on the river and that has affected the fish as well and really prevented them from coming back to the levels that they were uh, many years ago. Um, and then the other one is forestry. So my name is Dave Burt. I'm a fisheries biologist based out of Nanaimo. I became involved with the Jordan River in 2005 when I uh, was awarded a, a contract, a six-year uh, contract to study the fish abundance in the river. So that started me on, on the Jordan. I, I began a PhD in geography and planning at the University of Toronto in 2014, focusing on mine waste and, and mass mine waste contamination. I'm Jolene Rudicella and I'm a journalist with Capital Daily and I wrote a story about the Jordan River and its history um, earlier this year. My name is Mark Lajeunesse. I grew up here, was born here. My family was in the logging industry here. So I first started looking into the Jordan River uh, because I found a map that showed basically uh, all the contaminated mine sites in BC and I saw that there was one at the Jordan River and I'd never heard of it before. So I started looking into that and the more I researched I just found that there wasn't a ton on that mine that I could find. Um, so that got me really curious of course. So. The river became contaminated in probably in the late 50s, early 60s, because that's when the salmon stocks disappeared quite quickly um, and became extinct. Um, and the only thing that would make the river, make those runs disappear in the space of a few years is something like copper contamination. So I started reaching out to people I'd seen in the news about it before um, and one of those people was Wayne Jackman who lives near the Jordan River and I very quickly noticed that or I very quickly learned that there was so much more than just the mine um, that had contributed to the decline of the river. So it became a way bigger story than I expected. It was a, a typical kind of situation where a citizen was concerned, Ken Parkinson was concerned, he knew that there were toxins going into the river and he, he went to government with his concerns and government ignored him. And they got to the point where they wouldn't even return his phone calls uh, and, and yet he was saying, look, I've got studies here showing that the water is so contaminated with copper that it will, the river will not support salmon. And the, the source of this is the mine. And so somebody has to be responsible to clean up the mine. I'm, the Jordan River is such an amazing spot and the fact that there are actual changes that can be done to bring the Jordan River back to uh, how it once was. I think that's, that's super important and more people should know about that. There are two sources of copper. Uh, one is from that actual deposit leaching into the river and the other is that the tunnel, um, there's water comes down the tunnel from the underground mill room up river and that water flows into the main stem as well, and that's also contaminated. So there's, there was actually two sources of copper. So that was the start. And the fish numbers went from, uh, the, the average was about 1,500 chum, 750 coho. There was a steelhead run 
there were sea run, an adverse sea run cutthroat trout that came into the river. And in the face of a few years, everything disappeared and the runs became extinct. I would say like one aspect that I see that could bring salmon back is just returning water flows to uh, the old tail race from the old hydro plant. Um, we, I've, I've talked to old locals who used to live here back in the 60s um, that said, that just tell of the abundance of pink salmon that, that spawned up that, up that channel. I think finding a way that we could return flows to that area would be a good starting point to, to uh, seeing a significant amount of, of salmon return to the water or to the river. Oh, I can just remember there were so many the pinks in the river behind me here once you rounded the corner towards the powerhouse that you could walk across them. There was like a run of about 10,000 that were in there all the time. We need to get on the bit and, uh, and finish the cleanup and then BC Hydro has to do a much better job of managing the water flows in the river to, uh, to take into account the needs of the salmon because nobody's been thinking about the fish as, as they did the logging, as they did the, the damming of the rivers, as they did the mining there. Uh, people were set on uh, exploiting resources, but the last thing on their mind was protecting the fish. And, and we have to change that, you know, we, we have to change the, our whole approach to these things and start healing the earth. I would, I would say it just needs a fresh water source coming down here again, that would be enough enough fresh water for the salmon to go back up there. What I think is the main thing that needs to be changed uh, about the river is just awareness. Um, I think, you know, you see examples of, of these sick rivers uh, being restored and abundance of life being returned to them, like the Solemn River and the Puntledge River. And one of the main differences between those rivers and the Jordan River is just a huge population base that lives right next to those rivers and I think one thing that has enabled inaction in the, in the context of the Jordan River is just a lack of, of people understanding the challenges that the river face, faces. Progress has been made uh, after a, a law student, Matt Nevsted, sat down and, and did the research uh, and, and proved that there was corporate liability on behalf of tech, that they were liable to clean this thing up. Um, we did get an order, we got a remediation plan uh, being ordered and the big issue now is that we're over six years later, almost seven years later since the order and we still have not finished the remediation of the river and so the big thing now is to complete the remediation so that the salmon can start to come back because nature will heal itself, it, they will come back as long as you're not continuing to poison the water. It's contrary to what you might think, but learning about all the things that constrain this ecosystem has given me hope because you start to understand that it's not just the, you know, um, written in stone that, that this place is, or that the, there's not an abundance of life here, that, you know, we do really understand um, through various studies that have taken place what are constraining the ecosystem and what can be done to, to bring life life back.